Hello everyone, today we talk about dynastic partitioning in late, let's say mostly, medieval Germany. We'll be talking actually about high medieval Germany, early modern Germany even. You know that we have covered in some depth, uh, some fair depth, uh, the various German historical uh, provinces in our um, historical region series. And we have outlined, and not just for Germany, that's something actually we point out always, uh, ac across Europe yeah. with the same identical tendency and say by a certain degree the same outcome and this Christ dynastic um, let's say either extinctions or partitions without capacity of recompaction of particularly sizable success formerly successful uh, dominions uh, of some sort especially in a country like Germany collected in a very few dollars uh, way um, during, in fact, the mostly the, the 12th, the 13th century. Uh, today we will not look at the macroscopic factors in all this. We have put out there some substantial explanation for this. There, really, there are essentially two processes. One is the mid 14th century crisis, and the fact that literally there is an exhaustion in demographic and economical capacity for which um, there is. Um, uh, actually a much better foundation on the local level, certain powers, but a dramatic shrinking of the territorial extent of the same. This is true for all of Eurasia. I can argue for the world in, in that uh, dynamic. And the other, and I suspect a particularly historiographically overlooked uh, aspect, like a literal biological crisis, right? When we complain legitimately today, if we don't make um, enough children and we wonder why, well, we look at other moments of say first boom and then uh, stagnation and see what the psychological effect like the moral drive even in procreation really um, really substantiates uh, itself into right there is literally a genetic crisis for which I don't know you you hardly ever hear like we've seen it again in region by region in Europe for the, the 12th the 13th century like a dynasty like literally Ex going extinguished, like we, there is only one hair of the wall fortune. And it, well, there can be branches extinguishing, there are people of course dying prematurely for wars, illness, whatever, but overall there is actually a massive expansion, like a capacity of just of, um, of control that of course is possible because of the important uh, and unprecedented, like for medieval standards, levels of wealth and possibly unprecedented in absolute levels of growth. Um, uh, but literally there is the capacity of placing individual, you know, uh, elements of your offspring here and there and in order to keep the thing uh, together, even to the point that there is enough for everybody without uh, quarreling about the inheritance, which is a bit ideal in this regard, but definitely in a much more pronounced way than we see in, in late medieval times, where um, actually shouldn't be fooled here because the late German example, the yeah, late medieval German example is quite clear about the, as we'll see now, probably the, the fragmentation into therefore sub-branches, but very often the sub-branches are also the product of, um, say, they're not, say, pure dynasties in the sense of just that ancestral house that just ruled these places, but there is a much greater internationalization of the elite from the mid-14th century because in part of this literally dying out, um, and the tendency of the elite, given the, uh, let's say, the, the, the sinking, in fact, of, of the fourth estate, of the peasantry, of the commoners in general, uh, and actually also the emboldening, the empowering of the oligarchs that were sort of trying to parallel their, their power in that aforementioned territorial shrinking. Think about, in Germany, more obviously, the, the disgregation of, of, of the kingdom, right? The fact that, at least in a in this um, internal domestic power dynamics, and so the rise of the princes, right? There is this tendency of marrying um, at a very long range. Like, the, the the kings that would habitually make war against one another in a sort of more nationally oriented direction, at this point, they're mostly actually marrying to one another, still fighting sometimes, but mostly saying, okay, if we, and this is typical of Central Europe in many ways, if we manage to inherit individually, say, three or four uh, kingdoms, as it happened, Right with Germany, Poland, Bohemia, uh, Hungary, right uh, under a single a single person, 
Um, the, um, the, there is a capacity to at least centralize with a minimal surplus uh, collected from all these immense domains and with a relatively low pressure at a longer distance on the local oligarchy that actually would even elect, these are all elective monarchies, um, elect to, to actually have a, a foreigner that does not interfere much with his affairs but that gives that m much that can be accumulated in the sort of you know, wherever kingdom had been chosen, mostly the ancestral one, but not always, usually the most advanced, right? Uh, the more west you go. Um, to state built, um, and um, uh, let's say, and it, and it worked even to some extent, right? Um, so the picture here is the one, as you know, of a chronic political fragmentation. Like, literally, there's no other country that is say, institutionally more fragmented than Germany in Europe, right? You can have countries that overall are weaker, right? Even when they're more unitary, right? Germany as a whole was a much big, power, more powerful system, say, than Poland. It was also very, very big. But the latter is, um, is a, ideally also, but it's heading towards being a single kingdom with a single ruler de facto exercising the, you know, control in a uniformly recognized way. In Germany, instead, you have a constant, in a, yes, it's, they are elective, but they sort of have it easier with the dynastic, you know, uh, settlement, even though there would be dynasties dying out and the need at that point to call somebody else from the other side. So it's not to say that Poland was a more functional system in practice, right? But Germany is more fragmented. Germany has more princes that have properly a, a specific institutional role, not just some uh, status estate um, uh, that uh, state status that is just making them nobody touch their own stuff. They are actually like the the electors. They are the ones who run the system uh, in a um, also more advanced way because Germany is more advanced, in fact, that, um, than the other uh, Central European monarchies. But that um, witnesses the real existence of literally hundreds of states within the um, the same system. Um, I know it sounds a bit too superficial as an explanation, right? I didn't convince you, if anything, but um, you know that I made lots of videos about, now again, we don't have time to digress on Poland, whatever we'll see now, partially something about Bohemia. Uh, but in general, there is this illusion, like something more politically compact um, on the map, and the way especially we represent the uh, these countries, like in the from the 19th century, doesn't mean actually something more concretely factual. But it is true that in Germany there is literally like the rejection of such, um, let's say, unitary orientation that allows many princes to literally go out there to an unprecedented degree uh, of power. This is even more significant considering that Germany had had a say, uh, an important monarchic past, like, that, of course, uh, at, a, at a point, like, it was not so even, at aside from the different degree, the much more pronounced degree of privatization, at least compared to, to probably the, the Western mo uh, European monarchies strictly manned, that this country could not, would not evolve into a national monarchy, right? But there, there are other problems here. There is the German involvement in Italy. There is probably the deliberate choice to refuse that level of um, internal compaction uh, for that universal option. This is the Holy Roman Empire, so it's a, it's a different story and things cannot quite be compared uh, in the same way. And again, we will talk about the relations between... I, I would like really to make a video about German relations with countries like Poland, Bohemia and Hungary. It's something similar here and there comparing uh, these monarchies, but specifically as far as like the difference that derived from being probably the Holy Roman Empire, um, in especially in the German sense, meaning that the Bohemians um, would have just in the 14th century the empire, but fundamentally was just uh, that process of say I will call a foreign ruler like a, the French uh, Luxembourg um, um, for reasons that again already pertain to the crisis. But in the earlier times, like there were very interesting remarks uh, from the the. the the king of Poland, for example, mocking, and I remember, which I think it was in the same Sigismund, it was pretty late in time, um, that, you know, the, the Poles answered only to God, right? And almost like a sort of 
you know, um, the almost Protestant principle ante literum, um, even though naturally Poland was not at least largely affected by the by the Reformation, uh, unlike Germany. Um, while the, the idea was that the Holy Roman Emperor had to ask allegedly permission to, to the Pope. So this was just actually a, a passive aggressive way that the, the King of Poland had to, you know, complain like uh, with, say, with the Germans. But, you know, that we, we like very much both Poland and Germany uh, on this channel and that we actually try to to highlight the, the crucial role that these countries had in founding properly, the, not just Central European, but probably European identity in these very in these very centuries. Today we talk about something else, a thought of looking at certain specific dynasties that go fragmented, also a bit um, straddling actually the, the period, not making it just like the late Middle Ages, mostly yes, ending up like that, but st the thing starting sometimes with in this very intricate heraldic uh, forest, right, the, uh, let's say that that's original uh, and typically German sort of way of handling feudally and dynastically this myriad of um, of the little states. At some point were, like individually certain were, were, were powerful, but it was mostly the sum, the dynastic sum, right, you know, the dynastic collection of many that would make the thing. We've seen it often with the Habsburgs. We have really to cover an infinity of stuff uh, about that. And along the way we can um, stop uh, smelling the roses as far as single figures that we hardly discuss, like individually, um, say at the root, like a um, bit like the founders of these various houses, from which in fact this later uh, medieval, but sometimes up to contemporary branches until the end of World War I uh, in Germany would uh, remain standing properly in an institutional way, and some, of course, of which like, even exist um, up to this day. And there is no doubt that if you look at um, uh, medieval and early modern Germany, um, what contributed strongly the, the market regionalism um, or even provincialism of the country is the predilection even, like this habit of dynastic partition that the local princes really had for very practical reasons. Today we do not look at those patrimonial strategies or dy dynastic issues that as we've seen also in the single videos about the single houses, it's sort of very complicated. Um, today we just give a picture like saying consider this, that these were houses that at some point even held a, a very big concentrated power and that eventually split into uh, an insane amount of branches sometimes and even surviving at the end of the day but naturally in a very uh, depleted fashion even if you consider the sum of the wall like it's still not politically unitary like before and so that's uh, very 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 telling of the say crisis out of which what we call narrowly speaking the ancient regime was born from, like for the need of this also territorial routing right down the line um, dynastically and locally. Um, let's talk about the Margraviate of Baden. These are interesting ideas also for the single uh, historical regional series uh, episodes. Well, um, the division of this Margraviate um, that, as you know, bordered the, the Western um, Kingdom, right, uh, Western Francia. Uh, is as old, in fact, as the 11th century, when they literally still, France and Germany, called themselves Western and Eastern French. That as a frontier mark emerged in the division, or uh, made, like uh, scientifically in this sense, in a, with a patrimonial strategy, by the Zeringen. Right? This was a very important Swabian dynasty. Right? It would remain... Um, like, but like the name in in this um, in this century, of Swabian uh, power, the place is controlled. Well, beautiful, by the way. Um, they will talk more about Swabian history in detail. The reason why the the Margraviate of Baden was established was again very purposeful. Uh, it had to create the mark, as the House of Zeringen was rising to prominence in the area 
exploiting, by the way, the weakness of the Eastern Frankish monarchy. In fact, we are in the same years of the War of Investitures that we've been discussing uh, just recently, the videos about the Gregorian reforms. As you know, this in Germany would give rise to a further privatization of the system, a disgregation of further public authority that the, the Eastern Frankish kings had managed to, like, to... Um, to structure to an important degree, especially since they had been elevated to the Holy Roman imperial title. But these are also times of fast growth down to the local level. Germany never had had, it was already a you know, prominently elective monarchy, like that strong territorial control. So the, the hope was just like being elected as a king floating on the system, hopefully being sent to Italy where most of the resources were, but in the sense, like, not upsetting too much also the, the German princes at home, um, and allowing the latter, unfortunately for the monarchy, that had they had a better option, they, they would have pursued that. Like, it was, um, say, also the, the Mediterranean policy was actually a clever one just to gather the resources to strengthen there, considered that Swabia was, was to become, uh, as you know, uh, the center of the... Um, of the following house, like uh, of, um, of, of imperial house after the, the Salians, right? And therefore the Zavinger organized their dominion with establishing literally marks, like say monarchs could have done, like if we have the core lands and then here we establish this military mark that has more specific military uh, functions. This is how literally the Margravate of Baden was established. Now, troubles start as far as the further fragmentation, uh, like un an unwanted one specifically, in the, actually even before the 13th century. Um, and this starts because of the issues of the uh, Hohenstaufen succession in the time of Henry VI, Frederick II, that, as you know, start destabilizing significantly Germany. Uh, also with a, let's say, in fact, uh, a new center of power in the north, that is Saxony, that is trying to, like, to, to take away the throne from Swabia. Um, and what happens to the Zanga is that they're about to get extinguished, it would happen in the beginning of the 13th century, but they were a very ancient family. Like, they descended possibly from the uh, Ahalo things that dated back to to the 8th century even. So you have this very ancestral houses that in part had gone extinguished. And in this case, they they do, considering the recent power acquired like a bit earlier than, than the times. All right, and in the process, the Margaret of Baden is partitioned into an upper and a lower part, right? So that maintain the Margravial power. We're talking Achberg, and Baden, respectively. In turn, both these entities are subdivided, so there would be four lines by the end of the 14th century. And we're talking about f lines that are not the Zellingen anymore, right? But still, technically, like, bearing memory of the fact that this had been, once upon a time, a single Marguerite. Right, and so we will see this better uh, in depth, but there was uh, the aim to restore that unitary Margreville, um power, if anything, and probably they, they would split. Uh, in Germany especially, everything is privatized, everything is divided, everything is legally like recognized as, okay, we, we will just split it right in this process. And the senior branch of these four chunks actually manages to reunite between 1415 and 1503. So it's a long-term process because there's and the distance and also the time that almost one century later, um, even arriving to the Renaissance before this was accomplished. And just for three of the chunks uh, that we're talking here, Achberg, Zausenberg, and Durlach that included Baden itself. In spite of the senior branch succeeding in this feat, however, the you know division uh, of 1535, uh, resulting into in fact the distinction into Baden-Baden and Baden-Durlach, uh, 
was um, was paved like by the circumstances considered that these two portions would be reunited finally only in 1771 right and that tells you how sort of definitive in many ways the ancien regime had been how much again the the shrinking of the system and the rebuilding from from the bases and the sort of graduality slowness in this expansion especially in a region like central europe like was proceeding we have another example that uh, concerns actually the very very powerful house of the Belfen. you know this was a uh, dynasty dating to the carolingian era first settled in uh, from from uh, say the, the frankish background into italy then a branch coming back to germany essentially rising um to a level of uh, unprecedented prominence coming to challenge even the Hohenstaufen, right, uh, summing uh, the dynastical, in fact, Saxony, Bavaria. And the first major partition that this house undergoes is uh, in the 12th century uh, as well. We have Otto I of Brunswick, Lüneburg, um, receiving the latter and most of the land in uh, 1227 and his cousins the Duchess Agnes of Bavaria and the Margravine Irmgard of Baden keeping instead the town of Brunswick between them right and what happened is that the Emperor Frederick II of Swabia buys back Brunswick for autumn 1235 so that he becomes uh, also the first of Brunswick Lüneburg. This move was particularly relevant because Frederick II was not really um, a helper of Otto per se. He actually bought back Brunswick uh, for him in 1235, but it united it with Lüneburg as an indivisible imperial fief, right? And this deal was can't until the death of Duke Otto in 1252. Also later, actually, um, but um, Otto's children who wanted this territory to be partitioned lawfully amongst them led to the split in 1267 into the lines of Brunswick and Lüneburg separated. The Brunswick line uh, agreed later to another subdivision of its own um, entity. This resulted into Göttingen, Wolfenbüttel and Grubenhagen. There would be even further uh, at least variations in this divisions that would last until the reunifications, plural, because this again happened over time, in the 17th century, as the duchy of the older proper Brunswick and Lüneburg, plus the electorate of Nova, you know, why those lands, like especially the British audience, came to be a uh, recompacted and also what kind of dynastic sprint they would make internationally. The Göttingen line was preserved but at a new location. There were also lots of other inheritances in, in the meanwhile like sort of uh, mostly at this point being added to the wall but this was not the yet the original duchy from the 13th century because the line of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel was to survive literally as a separate duchy until the end of World War I. Admittedly the events of Brunswick Lüneburg are a bit uh, troubled also for German standards we've seen that normally even this level of partition was a bit too excessive but this is nothing in comparison to the uh, to the excess um, that is the one of Silesia, 
that, as you know, had essentially been born as a uh, as a Polish uh, duchy that, however, was absorbed by the uh, German kingdom together with the PS dynasty that, as you know, had been ruling uh, Poland in the high in part of the, the beginning of the late Middle Ages. Uh, the Piasts were a bit like, you know, we've seen the similarities with the human rulers, like this dynasty had founded uh, Poland, but had eventually fragmented into the various uh, principalities, most in fact the, the duchies, um, retaining this glue, right, this dynastic identity for saying, well, we are PS, so we have the right blood, we are all part of the same dynasty, we are the ones that should eventually succeed to the seniorate of uh, Krakow, that was like the, the key of, of, of the Rus. Um, Bohemia wouldn't have problems like this because it was more compact, like the, with the Premislids, uh, the, the, they would rule Bohemia and Moravia, and usually the, this dichotomy ended up not fragmenting to match the, the ensemble. Um, the Piasts had a problem of fragmentation within the same Poland. So in part, this Silesian fate is the continuation of a practice that, again, is very similar in this area of frontier between the Germans and the Slavs, where literally, like, it's even difficult to distinguish who is who, um, and in the same cultural uh, succession of practices. So Silesia was also a big thing, right? Uh, it was also rich in resources, historically. I made a video about uh, medieval Silesia, by the way. Uh, but it was sort of hopelessly fragmented. And this is much more typical of um, Poland, which is, in, the, in that sense, failing to centralize, at least in this Western, sort of more German-influenced uh, frontier. It's, it will be a contended area, like also the Bohemians at some point will sort of want to, to, to rule this. And exactly because of, of this literal, say, surrounding of enemies that wanted to, to grab a bite in the sort of the more uh, eccentric position of all the very centers of power, it sort of um, uh, couldn't quite do um, too much. At least it was not so big to profit from from this courting ritual, and actually its own nobility entrenched itself even more in its local prerogatives that were very much anti sort of monarchic, as we've seen in um, in Poland. Eventually, again, Poland substantiated itself in a after, in spite of the elective nature of the oligarchy sort of more unitary complex compared to Germany. Uh, and uh, as a wall, right, Germany was also bigger, telling the truth. But again, you you have mostly a compaction in certain areas. The rest of the country is that fragmented. The, the Poles have some, after all, some sounder uh, control of the wall. In part, again, because the local vassals were not so strong in the first place. And this is also mirrored by Silesia, because, yes, it's hyper-fragmented, but it, it's not much in a... Uh, like in a state-building sense. It's not that within Silesia you have certain chunks that grow particularly. On the contrary, you have the various districts sort of separating ever more from one another. In this area, there was a lot of warfare as well, so admittedly it wasn't an easy situation uh, at all. But you have the, it, it began in 1178 with Silesia splitting in two lines. Then by 1261 you have four, right? And by 1316 you have 17. This is insane, right? Um, and especially considering that this was a wall before. Um, the duchy was um, eventually uh, reintegrated ideally into a single principality under the Bohemian crown that in this sense had managed to overrun these individual piasts, right? However, it took still from the 14th to the 17th century for the last of these uh, Piast sublines to actually die out because they were entrenched after all in there. So you see, this was a case actually of weakening when where we have a, actually a crown that manages, after all, to um, to extend its control again. Bohemia was more unitary, and uh, again, it was bigger, of course, also than Silesia, but uh, it could exercise after all this influence also from, uh, like in considering what was happening in Germany. 
with the privatization and also Poland was more concentrated in the east of Europe. And this this land, there are all the ambiguities regarding properly the entering, let's say, the status of Holy Roman Imperial thieves, because some of these lands actually responded to courts that were in places like Krakow, for example. So um, it is that interesting. And um, we again, there is a video about medieval Silesia, but we will come back on it more, more in depth. I have a video coming actually talking about Silesia a lot, but it's a comparison between Poland, Bohemia, Hungary. Let's pass to a bit northwest than that. Uh, that is um, the Margravate of Meissen, right? The only northeastern Margravates that I covered for Germany uh, is, is admittedly uh, the, the Brandenburg one. We have to talk about Meissen because it's historically quite relevant, like these frontiers, uh, early frontiers that were established in, um, against the Slavs back in Ottonian times. From 1156, when the Margrave Conrad the Great retired to the monastery, uh, in habit, like to, to die there, uh, his numerous offspring um, would uh, habitually partition the totality of this holding. Right. There was still, however, the awareness that the Margraviate, again, as we've seen with Baden, had once been a single thing, right? We were also with uh, Lunenburg, Brunswick, uh, etc. Also, being quite successful at aggrandizing their power with further inheritances in the area. Like the northeast of uh, Germany had been uh, historically a bit more sort of unstable because a bit like in the Slavic eras because again it was an era of older settlement, say colonization, feudalization, and as such um, there are similarities uh, shared. But at the same time they have the upper hand because they're within probably the German world and they manage um, at this point in history um, we are, as we've seen after the, the mid 12th century, like to to start growing very much. These are areas in Europe take a bit longer to take off and sort of do that, say gradually still, like in terms of absolute uh, material accumulation, but still in relative terms more than other areas. So that's why they manage actually to compact these lines of Meissen descending from Conrad the Great to strengthen themselves. For example. Of Conrad's five sons, Otto succeeds as Margrave of Meissen. Right, so the actual title was maintained by, uh, say, it's not even a branch; it's literally the same Margrave, but it's held by one of the of the brothers that splits the rest of the actual holdings with with the rest. In fact, we have Dietrich installed in Lusatia. In the northeast of Meissen, there is also Brandenburg sort of infiltrating all this between between Lusatia and um, in Bohemia. At some point, yes, the the Brandenburgers managed to sort of consolidate some important territory. It was very strategic, but we must talk about Lusatia more more in depth. Um, and this territory, in fact, uh, of Lusatia had also. Um, uh, frontier function with Poland because it was itself like a martyr territory um, between Meissen and the, the Eastern Kingdom, right? And it wasn't clear, as we were saying before, like even to whom this really pertained. We've seen it, Silesia is just next door as well. There is this ambiguity, and it was normally, however, subject to Meissen because the Germans had just been stronger in the area had been also expanding with the Ost Siedlung um, further east in fact that uh, was gluing everything a bit together with a, with a mix literally of Germans and, and Slavs um, and mostly like with, with a dominant German presence in, in, in these areas. Now the three youngest brothers of as we've seen Otto and Dietrich children of, of, of uh, Conrad the Great received the Saxon counties, which the Vettins had 
he narrated. I forgot the most important part, like the the Margraves of Meissen, the, the family of Conrad the Great, were the Vatans, like the famous Vatans of, you know, that will rise, in fact, so importantly, still as late as we will see now, the 13th and 14th century. Uh, and that were, in fact, uh, pretty much about in, embodying this expansion in the Eastern market being quite tumultuous, but um, successful, right? Um, so, what did this uh, tree guys get. Henry was the Count of Betten, proper. Dado was the one of uh, Groich, and Frederick the one of Brenham. These were sort of smaller pieces, because the deal was always the same. Yes, you have to partition inheritance, but this must be done in a way that sort of maintains at least the cohesion, as, as we've seen in this case of the Margravate, at least is at a core level. Um, this starts being easier, say, in feudal times, not just because there is an international recognition of the rights of the firstborn um, and the um, sort of the, the easier way to channeling like a greater amount of inheritance in the hands of those who maintain the title of what was essentially a district, so provided with um, with a degree of also public authority that, as you know, in the, um, the Kingdom of Germany was often subcontracted. Uh, and, uh, and especially in this area. It's also about the fact that with feudalism mounting and social complexity increasing, there is also um, uh, let's say a, a greater ease, especially maintaining a bit, not necessarily territorial compaction, but at least to provide with some adequate uh, inheritance uh, of, of some level without causing too many uh, grievances among, uh, too many at least, among the, the various heirs. The Margraves of Meissen also inherit the counties of Torgau, Rocklitz and Urlamunde, for not speaking of the same land graviate of Thuringia in 1247. But more, the huge Franconian county of Coburg in 1353, much of the Vogtland in 1354, uh, with um, more of it even uh, in the following years. This is an immense amount of territory that, by the way, stretches across like a, a consistent part of Germany, right? Mostly we are in, you know, in, in the north, center, east part. Uh, but here we are talking again, like from moving from Saxony to Thuringia to Franconia. So we're talking about what had previously been stem duchy. So this um, tells you how not just Germany was growing, it had been cleared, uh, sort of bona fide, uh, um, deforested, and so on. But how also um, politics, feudal politics, could allow again these. Uh, houses to have greater holdings and to travalicate the ancestral boundaries of their houses. Uh, I made a video about the land gravate of Thuringia, I made a video about medieval Franconia. Uh, as you know, at this point in history, at least they are becoming sort of failed states themselves. Um, Thuringia had been squeezed historically between Franconia and Saxony and had mostly fallen under the edges of, of the second but it had also maintained some sort of, um, you know, autonomy, uh, and eventually this was lost and disgregated, and it tied itself once again to uh, the Saxon dynasties. Marconia was also more complex um, in, in some ways, and that's why the Saxons sort of managed also to, to, to permeate it. There is um, a competition, by the way, emerging in this 13th, especially the 14th century, between the Vettens and the Luxembourgs that, as you know, in the meanwhile, had become the uh, Bohemian house and probably the Holy Roman Imperial one, That's, uh, with, with, uh, with Henry VII, actually, and also with um, John, not, but uh, his son Charles IV, obviously becoming actually the, the most powerful ruler of his time, with Prague being probably the, the heart of 14th century Europe. 
Um, so these were uh, bordering, um, the, say, holdings bordering with, with Saxony. And the Bettens lost part of this land. By the way, I made a video about the the rise of Charles IV. I don't remember where the election, right? Mostly he was uh, being challenged by another concurrent that was Günther von Schwarzburg. That was not, not a Betten, but he had many Saxon supporters because, again, Bohemia, so close, was objectively scary, but never take, uh, take geopolitics for real because that's not how it works. And believe me, German politics is very, very, very intricate at this point. Uh, we will, however, see in part again the stuff. Um, there was, however, uh, um, sort of re uh, arrangement. You know that the Bohemians were most, like the Luxembourgs were mostly um, having problems with the Habsburgs, right, among the others. And there was at some point a settlement in the 15th century in, in which the Emperor Sigismund of Luxembourg, that was also like the last of the line and also dealing with many more things other than Saxony actually contented the Bethans in as a sort of reparation for what had happened back in the day with a substantial amount of um, Ascanian electorate of Wittenberg. The Ascanians were among those who had supported, by the way, the, uh, the election of Gunther and they were von Schwarzburg in the previous century and were the sort of the, the most ferocious opponents, actually, the Luxembourgs uh, in the area. Like, these were essentially the Principality of Anhalt, right, uh, that had split off from the Dutch of Saxony back in the day. So we're talking about Saxe Lauenburg, Saxe Wittenberg. Um, and these, uh, ter say, part of these territories were, but not only 1423 uh, with uh, Sigismund, but had been eaten up properly by the House of Bet and from the House of Ascania, right? So I'm making it very simple for the sake of showing you how certain pieces of former processions would end up in the hands of others, but in this there is no clear-cut sort of, you know, everybody was against anybody else in, in many ways, and alliances could always shift. There is, however, a definitive uh, partition of the what had been the Margravate of Meissen between, famously enough, the uh, Albertine and Ernestine lines in 1455. The reasons why these territories were fragmented would vary dramatically, also just in terms of patrimonial strategy of inheritance, of subdivisions, of wars between the various branches at Similia. In any case, this um, uh, partition of 1455 is finally revised in 1547 um, after an event that uh, really changes a lot in the balance of power in the region is the Battle of Mühlberg, in which the Bettens are crushed essentially by the imperial forces. The Battle of Mühlberg, we will talk about it at some point, um, took place in this uh, uh, lo uh, homonymous location in the electorate of Saxony during the famous Schmalkaldic War, right, where the Lutheran League had basically opposed, like, the Emperor uh, and his, um, you know, his various, you know, the broader power, in this case, actually, the uh, the Holy Roman Empire with the, the Dutch of Saxony uh, from, in fact, the, the, the Catholic side, plus Spain and Hungary in a general sense because of the Habsburgic inheritances and the Schmalkaldic Lutheran force was instead made up of the, the electorate of Saxons. So the Vettans were actually the leaders in, in this. The leader of the line was in fact a Vettan of the Ernestine line. Uh, and then you had uh, next to them Hesse, the uh, electoral palatinate, Bremen, Lübeck, even uh, Brunswick, Lüneburg. That we mentioned before, the Duchy of Pomerania, the Principality of Anhalt, Költen, and other German principalities. And this battle, to make the long story short, we will see it tactically at some point, was uh, a, a sound Habsburgic victory, um, so much so that the Schmalkaldic 
uh, league was dissolved uh, as a consequence and in fact Tibetans uh, prerogatives were definitely uh, revised to say the least to the detriment of the elector right and this state of affairs our ancien regime foundation in the, in the region would last um, in fact from the arrangements of Charles V to the end of the same Second Reich. Another illustrious dynasty here that we discussed also recently, uh, as far as the 80 years war concerns, of a long time from uh, not too much actually, like uh, less from half of a millennium at least in the uh, in the moment they started dividing their lands, the Counts of Nassau. Right, that begin to do so in 1255. And even though they are associated mostly with the Netherlands, they actually started in the county in fact, of, of Nassau, that is in the very center of Germany. Um, they split, as we were saying, their land. So the, there is all a history later with the, uh, with the orange, and this doesn't pertain, like medievally speaking, let's say the counts of Nassau divide their land. Uh, in the mid-13th century, and they, by surviving as a dynasty um, until secularization, Napoleon, so the end of the Holy Roman Empire in 1806, they never actually reunite all these possessions, right? They will remain split. There is actually a moment of great power uh, achieved uh, by Count Henry, who gathers an impress known as the rich, which is quite eloquent. He was count at 18, right, in 1198, until his death in 1247. And the expansion of this guy is prodigious because he takes, well, uh, you know, advantage of the uh, successory crises uh, uh, in the Kingdom of Germany. He doesn't leave up to the interregnum properly meant, but um, this is an area like in the center of Germany where probably Frederick II starts selling a lot of public rights. And uh, sometimes these local princes would simply seize it. Um, the Nassau does this um, from also the neighboring electorates in the West, which is a pretty serious deal. We're talking the most important ones, uh, Mainz, Worms, Trier, Cologne. As far as three, by the way, it was not just the Rhineland that was a very sort of autonomizing area that uh, would uh, historically just begin to detach itself at this point. In fact, from uh, starting from the same uh, from the same uh, archdiocese from royal policy, right? But Henry seizes territories probably from the empire at this point, from public uh, land from the land graves of Thuringia that are also sort of melting away at this point. And the the interesting aspect of this is that it's very unlawful activity uh, because a lot of these lands, um, is like uh, here it's valid for all the types, like, you know, either public, like private, ecclesiastical, um, were susceptible to the principle of the indivisibility under the same Lenrecht, that is the feudal law. But the Nassau's are a bit some sort of prepotent of the situation. Henry's sons Valram and Otto simply slice these territories in two along the line of the river Lahn. Valram seizes the southern part where Weilburg, Edstein, and Wiesbaden. Uh, are the main, at least, centers of power. The northern part centered around Dillenburg and Siegen, right? These were properly stronghold, fortified positions around which, like, feudal power revolved. Now, the interesting thing about Valram and Otto is that they're both counts of of, uh, of Nassau, right? So they sort of split, but they m do maintain the necessity, again, of the, the united comital power at the root of this all. In fact, the castle of Nassau itself, so probably the ancestral uh, home, 
is declared a condominium. So that basically can be used by both brothers that would convene there from their respective um, ter territories, as in dominions, as you understand. Um, there are several subdivisions eventually of the Nassau's, like for the Vettans. However, the Nassau's are more international, right? They um, start, they're not so successful as the Vettans, as we've seen, that have some contiguous territorial land, in spite of the various fragmentations to sort of pulp up their own, their own domains um, and consolidate in them. Um, but they have sort of a broader horizon uh, when it comes to acquiring inheritances and dynastic connections. This is in fact how they become connected with the Orange, that as you know were originally like a French uh, house um, that ends up, you know, making like their career in the Netherlands that we know, uh, generally speaking, better, right? But we'll have to talk about the Nassau's more in detail for medieval history because, again, these are all dynasties that you know, we're in another managed, right, to, um, to, like, even convince, after all, like, more powerful dynasties sometimes that was worth the uh, marrying with them. Of course, everything was very proportional um, in many ways, but having a foothold in Germany, dynastically speaking, was always interesting because of the continuously evolving side of the story. It was a low, uh, say, risk investment at least uh, considering the the size of it, and they could make you like, however, uh, reaching like uh, you know unprecedented results. Uh, but this was true for for them for the smaller ones. Um, for example, uh, the Balramians, so the uh, the offspring of Count Balram, end up in Saarbrücken, so in Swabia, in the southwest. Of Germany. The uh, Ottonians, which is not the Ottonians of Henry the Fowler, but uh, the offspring of the Count Otto of Nassau, are the ones becoming princes of Orange. Right? And it is this branch, of course, that eventually uh, essentially moves on and and uh, and manages to, to obtain a Kind of a power we were saying before, and as we were saying, all this, the United Provinces, etc., uh, and yet there are Nassau's in Germany, of course, and uh, until the, the secularization. So, um, what else? The um, there is always to dig into these families. I hope that this video sort of made sense sometimes make this videos are prepared and then I lay them out and I say well you know uh, did we get it or, you know is it, does it leave you with with, a, with an idea with something clearer than before because <laughs> with Schwerpunkt it's not that easy but it tells you in fact how complicated really history is right it's not much we could even focus I don't know on single dynasties actually I started doing this for the for very dynastic uh, feudal countries, let's say with bigger um, principalities like France. We made a video, for example, on the House of Bourbon that is effectively the first uh, about a dynasty specifically, um, a house, um, at least. And, and this is, of course, interesting, uh, but it's also important to see this comparatively. Like understanding, this is the thing I always like about medieval history, seeing things like in proportion to one another. Not just saying, well, this dynasty did this and that, and you know, or this house at least changed hands. There were these fiefs gained here uh, when the, say, the origin of the family was elsewhere, whatever. Um, and this sort of individualistic focus is okay if you you make many of these in parallel and you're able to dimension them however within the same content right what what really matters is seeing how they compare to one another otherwise you will essentially because this happens often on the internet unfortunately that people fixate on one group or another because they think oh my god 
I don't know, they have some reason, some personal reason of sort to, um, to sort of bond with them, right? Um, but um, the, the, the risk inherent to that is essentially making people unaware about alienated if you want like without that perspective just this is my team and i root for it and i don't care about the rest you cannot understand anything about your team if you reason like that especially in history like in, how can you fixate on a single place just say because it's yours and then not understanding what was going on in the rest like it's just shutting yourself down to some just circular um knowledge and logic and you will not understand the, the, the by default the more important things the bigger one the wall right so it's difficult we all have our limits regarding the um, of course the, the range of our knowledge te temporally geographically you see i focus mostly on the west because just it's easier obviously but for me but the it's not that I say no to, to the rest. I can't make a point, of course, of something more interesting being like also deriving from the quality of a narrower space. That's also important. That's why we make all these analysis it, about relatively minute topics. I, I presume that even this video sounds like, you know, oh my God, you know, how do you get into this stuff? Well, it happens, you know. Um, but overall, I get into this stuff because I get into other stuff, right? And it, it wouldn't happen otherwise. This is actually an advice to you, but many of you ask me sometimes, what should I read? What should I do to, to appreciate history, whatever? You should read, say, you should learn lots of different things. It would surprise you that I don't even actually read too much, right? At least in the conventional sense, it's, you know, I don't read often, like, an entire books. Uh, maybe when I'm on vacations, um, and I do it because over time I sort of accumulate the ideas of what I want to read, and I finally can do that if it is some sort of relaxing vacation, some sea side wasting time, you know. But uh, for that matter, there is the, the history, the cultural vacation that is it's about keeping to lear learning history. Um, but sometimes it's both, but rarely, but it's, it does happen. Um, the um, the point being, though, that what matters is properly researching, right? It, it's not how much you actually read or know, it's how uh, well and how purposely you do that, right? Reading a lot doesn't do it. It's just like, I don't know, trying to train yourself just by making a lot of physical activity. It, it's a dumb way of doing that. You have to train the muscles in a way that sort of adapt to an ever more effective result and so that you're not going to be just more performing but you're going to sort of be more complete in that uh, training in that effectiveness generalized uh, one uh, so history like the brain works in the same way and history is basically the best training ground because without this constant solicitations like this certain difficulties complications you can't quite go out there uh, and uh, succeed right so it takes a long 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 time uh, for today uh, however uh, I stop it here we will keep talking naturally about these dynasties there are lots of similar histories to this and it's interesting if anything to look at the uh, sort of the individual um, elements like sort of the, the even the, the smallest ones like in this case not just the bigger dynasties we'll come back on the Habsburgs hopefully soon however for today I stop it here just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time.